let's start the meeting. Let's bring the meeting to order. So we're going to start with uh, public invited to be heard, and I believe we do have one member of the public. Yes, Chair, uh, we have one guest. Um, if you would like to speak during this item, public invited to be heard, would you please hit star nine? Otherwise, we'll uh, continue on. I'm going to take that as a decline to speak. Let me go ahead and unmute him just in case he's... Just in case, okay. Yeah. Eric, is this you? Yeah, it sure is. There's no, I have nothing to say. Just here All to right. listen. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to mute you again. Thanks, Eric. Okay. All right. the, the minutes have been distributed. I think everybody should have had a chance to read them. Are there any questions or uh, discussions on the minutes? Any corrections to make from anybody? If so, just go ahead and unmute yourself and weigh in. Okay, without any discussion or questions, is there a motion to accept the minutes? I'll go ahead and move approval of the March 12th, 2020 Housing and Human Services Advisory Board meeting minutes. Thank and you. I'll Good second night. that. Caitlin, was that you? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. What we're gonna do in order to vote is if you are in favor, then you will raise your hand to the camera so we can see your hand and give Nicole a chance to leave it up long enough that Nicole can count. And then she'll give us the heads up and then we'll ask for any, uh, any nays to do the same thing. So if, uh, if you are in approval of approving the minutes, please raise your hand. Ann, has, is your hand raised? I wasn't at the last meeting, so I didn't think I could vote. Oh, fair enough. Okay, we're good. I got everybody, Chair, thank you. Okay, uh, is there anybody who um, declines approving the minutes? Please raise your hand. Okay, the minutes are passed, thank you. You might wanna do an abstention, Brian, so okay. Anne can, yeah. I'm sorry, did you say? Someone wants to abstain from oh, the vote. Oh, thank you. Uh, any I'm abstentions, sorry, please raise your hands. Okay. Thank so you I for the reminder, Anne Karen. Deanna abstaining. Yep. Deanna and Caitlin. Okay, perfect. Thank you. The minutes and are Anne. approved. Deanna and Anne. Oh, you're right. We'll help you out there, Brian. Please, it's gonna take a village. Okay, our next agenda item is selecting the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board member to serve as the TRG liaison and then to recommend TRG members. Kathy, would you please lead that discussion? Sure, so in your packet there was a uh, a memo kind of explaining everything that we actually went over in, I think it was your March meeting. It seems like it, that's a long, long time ago, but it really wasn't. Um, <clears throat> that um, to, in order to continue the TRG and their work in reviewing affordable housing um, applications, we need to reappoint um, five members that were, um, had their terms expiring. Um, if you remember, our intention was to analyze the work of the TRG and how we might, if how or if we might want to make some changes to the um, process and how um, the TRG interacted with the Housing Advisory Board as well as with staff. Um, because of a various number of things, we didn't get that analysis done last year. Um, obviously, we didn't get to it at the first part of this year. <laughs> um, probably. Um, it's going to be towards the end of probably second to or third to fourth quarter 
um, this year. Hopefully things will get back to enough normal that we can can complete that. Um, I did make some changes, just FYI, um, to the way the affordable housing applications um, are going to be reviewed. So in light of our discussion in March, um, we have um, aligned the presentations for any applications that we get with the mm, June, I think it's the June um, Housing Advisory Board meeting. So instead of the TRG um, hearing the presentations on their own separately, we're going to have a combined meeting so that everyone can hear the presentation. Then the TRG will go back and um, review, um, get additional information from the developers, and then make a recommendation, which will come to you. Um, and I'll have to let you know. I think it's the May June meeting or the June July meeting. I, I should have had that in front of me and I don't, um, but it is on the website. It does outline that. So that was one of the um, or changes that we made as a result of the discussions that we had in March. Um, so now we need to get a recommendation on filling those five positions as well as assigning um, or um, nominating somebody from the Housing Advisory Board to serve as the liaison to the um, TRG. Um, the five existing members that whose terms were expiring are good with staying on for another year um, in case we do need to make adjustments to the, the process, um, further adjustments. Um, and I did include in the um, packet who those folks are. They've all been on, on the TRG for a, at least a couple of years, if not um, a longer time period um, in the case of Lori Walker. Um, so if you have any questions about any of them, um, then you can consider your HHSAB liaison member and make a um, formal recommendation I can take to council at their May 26th meeting. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Any questions for Kathy? Yes. Oh, uh, you go ahead and unmute yourself, you. Sorry, I thought I did that. Um, I, I just wanted to disclose that one of the potential board members was my realtor several years ago. I don't think it's a conflict, but I just wanted to point it out. I don't have any ongoing relationship with her, but if you guys don't want me to vote on it, I would be okay with that too. Thank you. I don't know that there's any conflict there. It just seems like familiarity. Thank you for letting us know. Mm -hmm. um, okay, any questions? Uh, if there is, a, so let's do this. If there is a question, uh, like Deanna did, raise your hand and then I'll be able to call on you. And if we have several, I'll be able to order everybody. Okay, we just lost two people to the refrigerator. Uh, okay. Karen, did you have a question? No. Okay. All right. So here's my only question. Uh, well, I'll start. So Diane Groff and Jennifer are not listed as proposed. Have they timed out? No, they are. Um, their term goes through the end of next year. So they, oh, they don't need it. any action. Thank you. Okay. So we need two, do we need two votes here, Kathy? One to approve the, the reappointments as presented and then the other one for the liaison or can we do them together? You can do them together if you want. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any members who are interested in uh, functioning as liaison to the TRG for this next term? I'll, I'll just say that I've done it for the last year. Um, I have really enjoyed the work. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting the chance to listen to those smart people. Um, I would be happy to continue doing that. If there's someone that was really burning to take it up, um, I'm happy to have that conversation as well, but I'm, I'm willing to serve. Certainly. Great. Thanks, Jake. Anybody have that burning desire? Caitlin? Um, I just had a quick question. Um, to that point is, um, Jake, can you, I think you discussed this at our March meeting, but it would be helpful to maybe get a quick like bullet points of what the liaison does 
um, and sort of attending those meetings. Um, it sounds like we're gonna have a maybe joint presentations with them, but it'd be helpful to hear that again. Um, I was, I thought I had seen it and I am maybe just flipping a little too fast through all of my papers here. Yeah, the liaison functions in kind of a very similar way to how Councilmember Christensen functions here, um, attend the meetings, listen. I don't know if I'm officially considered a voting member, if the liaison is or not. I, I don't know. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I thought. So, um, so no, not, not necessarily a voting member, but someone who's able to be there at the meetings, communicate back to this board, have kind of a full picture of each application. Um, it'll be really helpful. It'll be a little different this year if we are going to have those joint meetings, which I think is wonderful. I think that's great. Um, if we are going to have those, it makes it a little different. But um, yeah, essentially it's being able to attend the meeting, go through the material that's presented, um, ask questions perhaps if there are any, but primarily it's kind of a sit and listen to the smart folks on TRG and communicate, kind of be a go-between for this group. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Kathy, or, or if, if, if that- oh, That was a good summary. Great, okay, well then I would like to nominate uh, Jake Marsing as our TRG liaison. Is there a motion for that? All motion for Thank Jake you, Marsing to be the liaison to the TRG group from HH. Uh, S A B. <laughs> yes. All right. And Anne, are you seconding? Okay. We have a second from Anne Baldwin. Sorry. That's all right. I saw two fingers. I'm so I assume that was code for seconding. Uh, okay. So all in favor of Nom of approving Jake Marsing as the HHSAB liaison to the TRG, please raise your hand. I got it. I just can't see Madeline. She, I think she left the room. Okay, just making sure it wasn't just my view. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So we've got everybody. Any opposed, please raise your hand. Great. All right, Jake. Thanks, Jake. You're Huckleberry, thank you for doing it. Appreciate it. Do we need and, to do- And then Meyer, and then Brian, you need to vote on the- yeah, the, the other vote. The, the oh. other, the TRG members. I was going to try to get that in as one, and I totally, oh, okay. Is there a motion to accept the reappointment recommendations as made by staff for the TRG members? Uh, so moved on, on that front. A second. I can Deanna, see. a second. Thank you. All in favor, please raise your hand to the camera. Okay, I got you guys. Um, who seconded? I'm sorry. Deanna. Thank you. Okay, any opposed, raise your hand. Okay, the motion passes, thank you. Oh boy, all right. Uh, item five, updates and feedback on consolidated plan, human needs assessment and 2020 action plan all of which Kathy is going to take us through these three items. After the three items, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions, get clarification, and otherwise have discussion. Uh, so take it away, Kathy. Okay, um, so um, I did provide a summary of the consolidated plan. Um, we are going right up to the wire um, with this, unfortunately, this year. Um, good thing we started our um, public input process and community engagement um, actually last year um, to get all of that in because with everything that has hit, it's been um, quite exciting to, to work on this with everything else. Um, I am still editing the actual consolidated plan. Um, 
even up until about an hour ago. Um, so, but generally speaking, the summary um, that I uh, is in your packet is, um, is, is still valid and is a good um, summary. So the consortium area um, that manages our, the home funds that come into the consortium, as well as the three communities that get CDBG funds, we combine together to have one consolidated plan that HUD requires um, that directs our, um, it assesses the needs um, in the communities for um, the upcoming five years and then um, sets strategic goals. And then um, every year we update it with our annual action plan goals um, for specifically how we're going to spend our CDBG funding. Um, so this is a, um, the consolidated plan, the big planning document, plus the 2020 action plan that gets submitted to HUD um, after the May 26th council meeting. Um, and the, the final public hearing that will be held at that, at that council meeting. Um, we already had made a lot of recommendations and, and funding approvals for the 2020 action plan, and I'll get into that in more detail when we hit 5C. Um, and then when COVID hit, we got an additional allocation. So we are making some recommendations around um, reallocating some of the 2020 funding and doing something a little different, and then um, new recommendations on the um, the COVID relief funding. Um, generally, um, this summary of the consolidated plan, there's an analysis of housing market data and affordability gaps. Um, we can, did a lot of community engagement, including, including a resident survey of over um, almost 1,200, uh, over 1,170 Longmont residents. Um, we had several open community meetings um, where residents could attend. We did individual interviews with stakeholders who work with residents who have low income to talk about um, policy and program changes. And then um, this will be the public comment period um, from May 20th to the 26th. So some of the findings um, were uh, that as everybody uh, is aware, there's low vacancy rates and rising housing prices and rents um, throughout the region. Um, <clears throat> rents and for sale home prices reached new heights, uh, humongous increases in cost of housing across the board um, in all of the communities. Um, home values more than doubled the increase in rents. Um, we increased about 64% um, over the, the time period and um, but we still remain in a, the most affordable jurisdiction in the consortium um, for what that's worth at this point in time. <laughs> um, interesting thing that seems to be um, poking up is that um, incomes have gotten a lot higher in Longmont and in the consortium as a whole. Um, with rental incomes increasing, um, which have dry, driven up rent prices, obviously, um, but it also increased the gap in very low income rental units needed. So what has happened is people with higher incomes have come in, they have taken over more of the units that used to be affordable. Um, the folks, um, property owners are charging higher rents. So while gen in general, incomes have increased in the renter population, um, there's a greater need for very low income rental housing. Um, the other interesting phenomenon is that rental, the number of renters with lower incomes has decreased from the last consolidated plan, um, which we think indicates that folks just couldn't afford to live here and have moved. Um, to a certain extent. So it wasn't a huge, but it, it was um, noticeable, the, the change in the incomes um, in the renters. Um, there are vacant, uh, it, essentially no vacant rentals. Um, we lost a significant number of privately um, provided affordable rentals. That kind of gets to what I was just talking about. Um, as the private rental market now serves renters earning higher incomes than 
than what they did under the, the last um, housing market analysis. Um, this shows that the table that was included in your packet showed a gap of about 2,300 units affordable um, to folks with incomes below 35,000. Um, so that's, that's an increase over, I think it was um, 1,800 to 2,000 under the last um, housing market analysis. Um, we have a lot of folks with severe cost burdens um, where they're paying more than 50% of their income towards their housing costs um, and a lot more that are paying over 30% of their income um, for their housing costs. So cost burden and severely cost burden is, has increased across the consortium. Um, so basically Longmont's primary housing needs include um, filling the shortage of 2,300 units, um, which would be affordable at $625 a month or less. Um, we've got a shortage of homes to buy, priced at less than $375,000. Um, housing subsidies to assist 3,700 persons with disabilities, many of whom are, whom are seniors. Um, that is gonna be hard to take on, but um, there's housing subsidies needed for 600 large families with housing cost burden and 1,400 female households with housing cost burden as well. And then 1,500 Hispanic households. So some of those um, might be getting some subsidies or are in, um, they're just not in units that they can, they can afford. So what we're looking at for strategic goals is to increase the amount and affordability of rental housing for our lowest income renters. Um, and then we added a little bit to this just today um, to also add in that we want to preserve our existing affordable rental housing as well. That's really important that we don't backslide. Um, we wanna preserve our existing affordable housing stock, um, which is primarily served by our um, rehab program, keeping um, existing owner occupied housing stock in good shape, um, in good repair, helping folks who are um, struggling a little to keep up with those repairs um, with the rehab programs and preserving um, the existing, um, that existing housing. So that was a high um, priority outcome in our um, community engagement process. Um, we also want to support low and moderate income home buyers and increase the supply of affordable housing units. That'll primarily be done through the inclusionary housing program versus um, using CDBG funds to do this. Um, it is very difficult to um, use CDBG funds to help um, folks purchase um, or to construct housing at all. Um, so using our inclusionary housing program is a good alignment and and fit to meet these overall goals. Obviously, we wanna reduce homelessness within the consortium geographic area um, through the um, work of the Homeless Solutions for Boulder County and continuing to prioritize permanent housing for folks um, as we move forward in the next five years. Um, providing community development and economic assistance to businesses, residents, and neighborhoods and needs. So this will um, address some of the COVID-related funding um, as we get into that in a little bit. Um, helping small businesses um, with some of the needs that they're uh, having being impacted by with the COVID um, shutdown, economic shutdown, and then also um, around community development um, if we need, if there's any of the um, facilities like the um, COVID relief center that we created in order to um, address um, the needs of homeless folks who were experiencing symptoms of um, COVID-19, that is something that we can fund with our CD, CV funds um, and is included here as well as um, rental assistance or direct um, assistance to individuals. So that is a quick brief summary. The document is probably over 170 pages in total. Um, it will go up on the website um, probably early next week. Um, again, the notice will be in the newspaper for the um, advertising the public hearing and the comment period. 
um, on May 20th. So I would be more than happy to answer any questions that anyone has around this particular topic area. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions for Kathy? I have a question, Kathy. Um, sure. I did read um, an email from that was sent uh, by Nicole from a representative from Boulder County talking about these these various uh, needs associated with COVID funding and, and the COVID effect on um, these human service organizations. And I guess I'm just wondering, um, you know, in light of an anticipated shortfall in all government budgets next year, it would be smarter to allocate those funds to shore up shortfalls in the, the foreseeable future for, you know, just status quo budgetary concerns rather than um, expanding what we're funding now. Does that question make sense? I think so. If you're asking, can we use CDBG funds to replace lost government revenue? Yeah, basically. Yeah, we cannot. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that is prohibited under, um, yeah, CDBG program. Yeah. Councilman Christensen. Um, Kathy, I'm wondering, it seems to me over the last, since 2008, there's been very little detached housing built. It's almost a home, uh, homes to buy, particularly in the middle income and lower. Um, do you, is that seem like a trend that's going to keep up because that's a huge part of the problem? I would say yes, that is a trend that's going to continue that probably we're going to be seeing more attached product um, for home ownership, just based on what we're seeing coming through, um, you know, in the development pipeline right now. And do we know how much of our previously available homes for purchase and for rent are now being used for Airbnbs? I can tell you a lot in my neighborhood are. Well, um, anything that we invested in or subsidized is not um, because every year folks have to certify that they, you know, it is owner occupied um, and we do check um, utility bills as well. Um, that doesn't mean they aren't, you know, occasionally maybe renting something out, but we haven't really heard that. And, and usually folks that are in either under the previous inclusionary housing program or um, well, habitat units um, are, are generally not used that way, um, which is our primary investment um, yeah, of okay. CDBG funds in for sale housing okay. product, um, as well as Blue Vista. They have um, quite stringent um, occupancy requirements and use requirements on them as well. Um, so I, I would feel pretty comfortable saying I doubt if there's any of that happening. In, in, the, in, the, in the units in the that the city that has are, invested in yes. or subsidized, right. correct. I'm just, uh, maybe I'll ask Joni or Don yeah. Bouchette about that. If you're overall. looking at, if just in general in the market affordable yeah. um, and what is going on with that, that would probably be quite a different story. Yeah, I think it's usually about, you lose about 2% of your housing overall, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jake. Hey, Mr. Chair. Uh, Kathy, just um, quickly, it's not necessarily on this topic. Thank you for the thorough presentation. I am curious about if staff at this point has any rough estimation of COVID's impact on the affordable housing fund in general. Um, I'm curious specifically about the progress of any of development that had been in progress where what are develop what's the tenor from developers that have been working with the city i'm i'm curious about you know we were on this kind of trajectory with with the iz that seemed fairly friendly um and as we talk about these issues that this plan works with so many of them are connected to affordable housing so i'm just i'm curious if there's any 
sense that you have about where we're at? Well, um, <clears throat> so developers and developments under that were underway under inclusionary housing before um, we went into um, say, um, stay at home orders um, appear to still be moving forward at this point in time. <clears throat> we haven't had anybody that I am aware of withdraw anything. Um, things might have slowed somewhat. I'm thinking of some of the smaller developers um, that they might not be moving as quickly as they, they were, but so far nobody has stopped anything that I'm aware of. And I'm also hearing from planning that they really haven't seen any big decline in new applications or um, they're still holding pre-applications, they're still holding DRC meetings, development review um, committee meetings. Um, so things, at least at this point, seem to um, be moving along as, as in normal. Um, the things, the projects that we funded that have been approved for funding um, over the past year or so are moving forward. Um, the in-between is looking for um, something to purchase. They actually had an offer on one property and decided it was too expensive and are, I think, trying to um, go under contract on another property, so they're moving forward. Um, we just received word that the Cinnamon Park um, Senior Independent Apartments uh, just got tax credits, so they're moving forward. So we're moving on a, our agreement with them for affordable housing funds. Um, so nothing that I have heard of yet is in jeopardy or won't go forward at this point in time. Now, something you know could happen. There's another project that's in for tax credits that we haven't heard if they've received or not. Um, so we'll, we'll wait and see on that. But um, if we have allocated funding for it, everything that we've allocated is moving forward if they're, if they're ready to go. Um, we're not in danger of having, my understanding, and Karen can correct me, um, of having any of the affordable housing funds that have been allocated to the fund to date are not in danger of being recaptured or recalled. Um, the 2021 budget may be another story. Um, obviously, marijuana um, tax that we get, um, the 50% of that may be down. I've heard that marijuana um, sales are down. I, that doesn't really make too much sense, but um, <laughs> um, that's what I've heard. So we're planning on a, a lesser amount from, from that source. Um, and then, it, you know, we just go through the budget process like everyone else and see where we fall out for 2021. That's, that's great, Karen, uh, Kathy. Thank you so much. That's especially good news on the planning side as well, if that's the case. So much better than I was hoping, than I was thinking. So thank you. Caitlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Kathy, sort of along the same lines, but I guess the other side of that, um, you know, we're seeing what, what you've shown here is like, we've got a pretty big gap in the rental market. Um, have we seen any changes in terms of um, folks looking um, and applying for um, like city? I know that we've got some like affordable housing projects, but also we've got community partners. Have we got a sense from any of those if there's an increase um, in folks that are looking for assistance right now, what those kinds of increases look like um, from, from sort of like the COVID related things? Um, well, so if you're asking around um, if there is a need for assistance for people to make rent um, or mortgage payments as a result of layoffs due to COVID or job loss due to COVID or wh whatever. Yeah, I, I would say that's up quite a bit. Um, the R Center has been um, the main area in Longmont um, for folks to go to for that, that assistance. Um, Boulder County has st um, stood up, st stand up. They have started a housing helpline <laughs> to um, make referrals for folks. And they have also repurposed a lot of the, um, their emergency shelter grant money, as well as what's the other source, Karen, that they, they're, um, 
uh, TANF money, <laughs> emergency TANF money um, to help um, residents with that. So that has been a, a, a real help um, for folks being able to get assistance. It is still not enough. It, there probably isn't enough. Well, at some point there's enough money in the world, but <laughs> we're, we're probably not gonna reach that point um, to be able to do that. Um, my understanding is that a lot of the um, unemployment money is now coming through. The um, $1,200 uh, direct assistance is coming through. And actually some folks that are already in subsidized housing that might have somewhat of a gap um, because of a loss of a job or um, between those two funding sources, if, it, if they get both of them, are probably actually gonna be better off um, unemployed <laughs> than they were when they were employed. Um, so that's kind of a different phenomenon um, for, for those folks. So um, people that are in the um, under a housing choice voucher, um, the um, amount that the voucher pays increases as their income decreases. So they are in effect covered um, by that increased amount. Um, so that um, is not harming people. So um, in Longmont, because we have our housing authority has um, such a skew towards senior housing, um, it, they are in a particularly good situation because the seniors are not losing income. They don't depend on you know jobs <laughs> for the most part. I mean, some of them have um, still work, but um, most of them are on some type of subsidy that, um, or pension or, you know, retirement that isn't impacted um, by COVID. So um, that has been a real actual benefit for the Longmont Housing Authority in particular. Thank you. Eliberto? So I just wanted to concur what Kathy said. I've, I've had uh, monthly meetings with the R Center and I just had my monthly meeting with them yesterday. Um, and they basically said that they, when there was a huge increase at the beginning of the crisis, but now that uh, the UIB unemployment benefits have started kicking in, uh, it has slowed down. Uh, they're concerned about later on this year, uh, but um, the UIB is really helping people make uh, through the, through these the, this month and next month. They feel that they that um, those are, are really helpful. Yeah, that's good news. Kathy, I'm wondering, just looking at the big picture, so this we're going to have an ongoing economic issue for the next several years. So we're going to have increased need, like we're seeing already starting. Uh, we know that local revenues are going to be lower from sales tax and other taxes. Are you seeing with some of the packages that are, have been proposed or are still being proposed at the federal level that there may be funds coming that will help fill in that gap? Or is that just really unknown at this point? Um, I haven't heard anything specifically to fill in government funding at this point or the loss of, you know, tax revenue or anything. There's been talk about it, um, but I have not seen anything proposed. And I have to admit, I have no idea what's in the um, recently proposed um, $3 trillion bill that just came out or was just proposed earlier this week. Um, so whether that has something in there or not, um, but it's, um, it's gonna be bad, <laughs> you yeah. know, unless the economy gets up and, and going. Um, we are looking at um, using the, the uh, CDBG CV funds for kind of later activities because of what Eliberto just mentioned that some of the um, federal funding is kicking in for individual residents. And so as that um, expires, then there may be, um, if they aren't back to working, there may be assistance that's needed is where we think um, that will come in, that we will come in kind of more at the back end or in several months versus, you know, immediate kinds of assistance for the, the businesses as well. Um, mm -hmm. There's a new program starting um, called Strongmont where we're gonna be uh, 
providing with uh, partnership with the DDA and the city and the um, Longmont Economic Development Partnership and the Community Foundation um, grants to businesses um, to help them over the hump um, and get open again. Um, and we're thinking using the CDBG funds that we're um, proposing to be set aside that again, that would come in a little bit later when, because we have to show that we're not duplicating other funding. Mm -hmm. um, so if businesses can show that they've been turned down by other funding, that will help with that. Um, but also it is a resource that there's more strings attached to it. So it might be more palatable for businesses and a better use of funds to come in a little bit later um, as a kind of funding of last resort, I guess you you might view it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Shakita. Thank you, um, Chair. I, looking at those numbers and looking at the burden, um, let me see what the actual terminology was for that, but, um, you know, what are we going to do to keep people who are not really, who are renting and do not qualify for, um, you know, uh, public services? And of course, the rent is, you know, has increased in Longmont. Is there a plan to retain the people because the residents that are here who are contributing to our community, um, what are we doing to retain those residents who are like in the middle, you know, who are barely making it, who are not making 75000 a year, um, but yet they're barely making it and every year rent increases. And how many times can they, how many times are they able to go in and ask for assistance with rent um, how many of those people are just packing up and leaving when the rent is over, you know, mm -hmm. when the lease is done? How are you retaining these people? I mean, I don't know if there's a program that I don't know about. Um, it's beautiful here and everything, and it's nice, but if you get people who are making $200,000 that's coming in and moving in, it's going to be like another boulder and people are moving out to less expensive places. Although I understand Longmont is supposedly, you know, less expensive to rent here and to live here, but for the people who are in the middle, who may not be really low income and, and may not be making $75,000 a year, what about those people? I think they're kind of getting you know, push under under the rug or pushed in the closet. I don't know. I, it's a comment. I'm asking a question, but yeah, that's just how I'm feeling listening to everyone. And I'm thinking because I'm like one of those people, you know, like I'm ready to get up out of here because like it's hard. It's really hard to afford it, to afford living in Colorado. And Longmont was used to be when I lived here, when I moved here eight years ago, it was affordable, even as a single mom. But now it's increasing. And what are what what programs are out here to retain people like me? Well, I don't I don't have a good answer for you. Um, we try and have a range of services, and you know, understand that the funding that um, the city has control over is is small in the overall scheme of things. Um, and um, it, so we, within the regional um, affordable housing partnership plan, which all of Boulder County um, communities have um, bought into and have approved and is using that as their goal. We do have a full a range of um, services and housing that we're trying to provide. Um, so, the plan calls for everything from um, no income up to 120% of area median income um, for home ownership on the on the the top side and everything in between. 
right now the city's rental assistance programs um, where we are funding uh, development projects can go up as uh, up to 60% of area median income to be served, um, which is getting closer um, to that area that you're that you're talking about. Um, 75,000 is probably 70 to 80% of area median income um, at this point. Um, the homeownership um, programs are um, generally between um, 70 and 120%. And rental is generally between nothing to um, 100 or 60 percent area median income. Um, so we do try and offer that wide range. Um, when you get into competitive funding situations, you are usually trying to prioritize um, the um, the highest priority needs, I guess. Um, which, you know, according to the market analysis um, is um, probably 40% area median income and below for rental housing. So it's a real balancing act. Um, I have to say that a lot of the rental, um, the private sector rental market, um, especially if it's a tax credit project, is usually hitting at that 60% AMI level. Um, so there um, theoretically there should be more units that are affordable um, but again um, and and there's income limits to um, be in those units but the competition is just so great across the board um, for that that they're just I would say across the board there just aren't enough units and how do we how are we ever gonna <laughs> you can't you keep saying you can't build your way out of it, but that's a, how else do you create new units without building them? But it costs so much to build as well. Um, so I, I really don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> I think at this point, um, it is something that we are cognizant of and we're working on and we're including, um, but um, I would say that's one area we're not doing a great job in, unfortunately because of a lack of sufficient funding. I think it's really difficult in an area that has a wealth gap this large to get traction on some of those issues because a lot of people fall in between. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, and the other thing is if we had gotten, been able to get to the point with a ballot measure in 2020, which is where we were heading as part of the Regional Affordable Housing Partnership um, before, everything changed, um, you know, that might have helped a lot because we were looking at trying to raise 50 million a year, I think it was. It was a goo gob sum of money. Um, and we hadn't tested yet to really know if it was going to be successful. But that is the ultimate, about the only, uh, main way to raise a significant amount of funding is if we are able to pass some kind of ballot measure where it's a, whether it's a property tax or a sales tax and then what are people going to be able to support coming off of this you know it's it's a very bizarre situation we find ourselves in hmm. thank you kathy jake were you wanting to say something yeah, I was just going to thank Shakita for the comment and, and offer one little point because um, you hit the nail on the head. That is, for me at least, the core question kind of facing the city is how do you f make sure that working class folks can make it um, in Longmont, folks who built the community? Um, that's the challenge, and I don't know that there's a good answer. And then I would just I just wanted to add that um, part of the bill that's been proposed, Kathy, includes a trillion dollars for uh, state funding, for state relief. How that trickles down to, to local governments is, I think there's an, there might be an additional appropriation, but I need to talk to, the, to Nagusa's people. He had a bill that kind of got folded into the big package. So um, that, that is certainly on the minds of some folks in Congress, whether it happens or not, we'll see. Thank you, Jake. And thank you, Shakita, for the comments. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, if there's no further questions or discussion, Kathy, are you, uh, did you make it through all of your items? Um, not 5C, so I would like to put that up and just go over a little bit of what we're 
um, recommending because normally we would get um, you guys' um, input and sign off um, before and because of the quickness that we were trying to move this through um, and the new allowances um, in citizen participation. Um, let me get my thing back here. Um, we um, were taking staff recommendations right to council. So getting some kind of feedback here would be, um, would be um, good. I don't know that you have to take a formal vote or a formal recommendation, but um, I would like to kind of walk this through and hear your comments. So what we, um, over on the far left, um, my left, I guess at your left as well, looking at it, <laughs> um, where it says 2020 CDBG approved funding, that is where we, uh, the last um, approval for 2020 that you guys recommended and actually council approved. So it had funding 304,000 for rehab program, the money for the housing counseling program, the security deposits for um, folks coming out of um, homelessness, um, and then um, uh, competitive housing funds that were approved for the in-between and the Longmont Housing Authority, um, Aspen Meadows Apartments Refinance and Rehab um, for a total with um, reallocated money and uh, estimated program income, a total of a million twenty one thousand um, that was uh, recommended and, and approved. So what we are recommending in light of COVID is to repurpose some of the 2020 funding um, and basically taking the, the rehab money here um, in the middle, the 304,000 and repurposing that for um, additional uh, funding for COVID related activities. So we're showing in this um, next column in, um, moving to the right, still retaining 50,000 for housing counseling and the security deposit um, assistance, but then allocating 258,000 for individual assistance, which is um, likely to be um, a grant um, uh, to the R Center to then turn around and give out for rental or utility assistance. Again, maybe a little bit later um, as things um, pick up. And then 70,000 being set aside for Longmont share of the COVID Recovery Center um, operations funding. Um, we hope to get some FEMA funding to offset this, but in case we don't, or in case we have to match it, we're setting aside um, our share uh, of those operating costs. So that would be the bulk of the repurposed um, um, rehab funding. Everything else stays the same. And then the additional CDBG CV funding here, kind of in the middle, we got um, just under $360,000 in a special allocation. Um, and we are recommending that we use um, an additional 87.5 for individual assistance and an even 200,000 um, for small business assistance. And again, we would be doing that either through providing loans or grants to um, businesses as part of the Strongmont um, business grant program, or we might do something, um, actually I need to change this because it's not for sure. We might do something with Colorado Enterprise Fund, CEF, um, to help offset some of the um, Longmont businesses that have um, outstanding loan payments to help um, do some forgiveness, especially for micro enterprises, businesses that are five um, or fewer employees. Um, we are still gathering information, Colorado Enterprise Fund, um, so I'm not sure yet what the, the split would be, or even if we would do anything with them, we have some time to gather that information, but generally 200,000 being set aside to help small businesses. <clears throat> so then the uh, column uh, titled totals just adds everything together with the um, CDBG um, funding 2020 and the new COVID money. Um, the orange highlighted column is just what we um, are allocating or that would go for COVID relief, which includes the special funding as well as the repurposed funding. And then I added some information um, on the households or persons or businesses that would be, we're estimating we, we would serve with this funding. 
Um, so about 240 households would be served through the housing counseling program, which could be eviction prevention um, or foreclosure prevention or um, their normal funding um, with um, um, housing counseling and um, debt relief counseling. Um, estimating um, 230 um, households would be assisted at about 1,500 each. I just had a wag there on the individual assistance. Um, the CRC operations, I think we served four folks in the COVID Relief Center. That might be a little bit more. I'm not quite sure on that, but I plugged in four there. Um, and then an estimated 20 businesses um, with the small business assistance um, funding, um, eight, at least eight for the in-between when they um, finally purchase a project and then preserving 50 units through the um, Aspen Meadows refinance and rehab. So a total of a little over 550 total households, persons, or businesses would be served. And then under this allocation, over $15 million um, would be leveraged in other public or private funding. So um, I think, um, Susan, you can take this down and then I would be more than happy to answer any questions. You should have gotten this today, I think maybe, sorry about the lateness of it, but I think Nicole sent it out um, today, um, but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions about what we're proposing. Thank you, Kathy. Graham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think most all that looks great. I, I think the only one question I have is about the around a quarter million dollars you're giving to the care center for individual assistance. And I just am curious how um, how that's going to be administered. How do we ensure the money goes where we want it and that it doesn't just get wrapped up into uh, the our center's day to day business as usual. And maybe just like why why them? Why didn't you know, staff administer that money? Um, those are my questions. Yeah, good questions. Um, so we um, think it's, it's usually better to um, fund a, a program that's already operational uh, as opposed to standing up something new and particularly staff taking on yet another new venture right now. <laughs> um, so that's it, but we would have an agreement with the R Center um, CDBG funds, like I have mentioned many times before, are quite different than other funding, the human service agency funding or um, any other um, private funding that they might be raising or um, even the, the county TANF funding, funding that they have gotten. So we'll have to have a clear understanding with them and we would have a sit down before to make sure they understand all of the requirements that they have to meet, um, what they would have to do to income qualify folks, to um, determine eligibility to ensure they're not duplicating um, other benefits and then we would have all that wrapped up in a contract and there would be ongoing reporting and probably a little bit heavier oversight um, and more often oversight um, of how things were going um, for that so I think we can be fairly directive it doesn't necessarily have to go to the R Center but they are really the agency that is most prepared um, and is already serving folks and is well known in the community um, as the place to go for this type of assistance. That was our reasoning for that. Okay, thanks. I think if I could add um, is that, you know, most of the uh, communities that are getting the, um, in Boulder County that are getting the CDBG COVID relief dollars are really trying to invest that in those existing family resource centers. So Sister Carmen, EFA in Boulder, and then our center, as, because as Kathy indicated, they are already providing rental assistance and individual assistance. And so it just, it just bolsters their ability to serve more people faster. Thank you, Karen. Yes, Caitlin. Um, thanks for asking. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks for asking that. Um, Graham as well. I had the same questions. Um, one thing I'm curious about is um, the repurposing of the monies that were previously allocated for like rehab funding that which help keep people in their homes. Um, and then also about the, that small business assistance and why, you know, sort of looking at the number of folks served by the small business 
assistance versus the individual assistance? Um, and why go through a small business assistance rather than giving more individual assistance? Good questions. Um, so, um, the reason we chose to repurpose the rehab funding um, is because with COVID, people didn't want people in their homes, and quite rightly so. So the rehab program um, was put in abeyance um, when this started. Um, so, and it's probably going to be quite a while before um, it comes back. Um, so we felt that with those two things keeping in mind and the funding that we still have available um, in 2019 funding, rehab funding that hasn't been allocated yet um, for specific projects, um, that we could easily um, and uh, repurpose that money. Um, we are probably not going to even open up applications for rehab um, funding until later in the summer. Um, anyway, um, we are continuing to serve the folks that were in process and that we halted when um, stay at home went into effect. Um, it's just now starting to open back up. Um, so we um, are starting to work on exterior um, items. We're still holding on interior items until things get a little more clear around um, protocols and stuff like that. Um, but then finishing up what we have in process, we'll continue to process um, emergency situations. So if somebody's water heater goes out or furnace goes out or something like that, we'll continue to do those. But to open up the program again, um, I think uh, we, uh, it would be prudent to wait until later into the summer before we even start taking applications again. So and those emergencies, sorry, those ahead. emergencies are coming from the 2019 funding that has not been fully spent yet. Is Correct. That, okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's helpful. I remember we had talked about there being a carryover. I just thank you. Yeah. That helps with that piece. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then um, I think with, Assisting small businesses, what makes sense to me is that um, for every job you can bring back, you have helped a family. Um, it may not be included in this total um, because it's really the business we're assisting, but there's many more families that are being assisted when you help a business come back and they can bring their employees back. Um, and um, it's kind of a, a behind, uh, backdoor <laughs> um, housing assistance, if you will. Um, so that's why we were thinking with the, with the small businesses that it's another way of supporting families as well. The more employees they can bring back, that's another family that doesn't need rental assistance necessarily when they can, they're employed again. And Kathy, that small business piece, are those loans or are they grants? We're looking at um, grants, I think, as opposed to loans. Um, one, it makes it simpler, um, and there's no long-term reporting then. Um, and, you know, when we did this before, um, many years ago, we did a small business um, revolving loan fund, and the purpose was to provide loans and generate um, income that would come back through loan payments and revolve it and support more businesses so it's an ongoing kind of thing. This is seems different and, um, you know, to ex have a business take on more debt during this time just doesn't seem right. Yeah. The Strongmont Fund is set up to be a grant, so we thought we would just do the same thing. And we're allowed to. We can choose to do grants or loans. And these funds, um, I think you said this, but just to make sure, um, these would be, you know, available if there's not other funding available for these small businesses. That's correct. We can't duplicate or um, supplant other funding. Got it. So if they qualified for federal assistance for some piece of their operations, we wouldn't, you know, essentially give a grant that would cover that those same costs. It would have to correct. be for something different if they. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I certainly support the grants versus the loans. I think going into a major recession is a tough time to take on extra debt. So. Um, 
that's just going to lead to more mental health issues, more stress and more failures. So I'm glad to hear that. Any other feedback for Kathy? Yes, Madeline. Uh, yes, I, uh, before I have to go, I wanted to ask how are people, if we are making available grants for the small businesses um, that are experiencing um, what everybody else is experiencing right now, uh, how, how would they go about, how do they find out about it? How would they find out about the, um, the requirements? And just more about it. Well, mm -hmm. Where would I, for instance, be able to direct someone to? Right. So um, the, um, like I said, the Longmont Community Foundation is administering the funds called the Strongmont um, Fund. I think it's called Strongmont Fund. I know it's Strongmont. I can't remember if it's program or fund anyway. Um, so it will be on the um, Longmont Community Foundation website. Um, I think they're going to open applications Monday, maybe the 18th. Um, and it should also be on the Longmont Economic Development Partnership website, the DDA website, um, the Chamber website, um, and I would imagine the city website since the city's also contributing to that, um, some of uh, their direct funding. So um, all of those should be open. I think it is only going to be open for a very short period of time, though. Um, so if you know of somebody that might be interested, I would start telling them and have them ready to, as soon as the application's open, to, to submit. All right, thank you. Yep. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night, Madeline. Yes, Jake. Just a quick question. Kathy, do you happen to know uh, on that fund if nonprofits uh, or religious organizations qualify for those dollars, which is, um, you know, just whether they, it's the same as the CARES Act in that way, or is that the Community Foundation would know that, that answer? They would know that. It should be on the thing, but I believe it is, does not include nonprofits. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yes, Caitlin. One more question on that um, fund being administered by the Longmont Community Foundation is, um, the 200,000 that is reflected here, is that the only money that the city is putting into that fund or is the city contributing from other sources um, in the budget or otherwise? Yeah, so the city is putting in, I think it's 50 or 60,000, I think um, that they had allocated for, um, to support economic development efforts. So they're repurposing, um, City funds, um, the general funds, I think, basically, or what have been a little more than that. Okay, but I think it's close to a hundred, maybe ninety thousand or a hundred, something like that. Okay, but it's from money they had set aside for economic development, and they're repurposing into into this fund. And the and also then um, the Lamont Community Foundation is is raising private dollars for that. You know, and Eric's listening in if he wants to chime in. <laughs> <laughs> if we're saying something wrong, stop us. But uh, but yeah, so it. I think that they're certainly drawing from different sources from throughout the community to bolster the amount of dollars that's available for these uh, small business grants. The, the um, uh, council is also contributing $30,000, which I wanted to go to individuals, but it's going to businesses. So we're trying to pull money from every place we can. Um, and, um, oh, there's also, the Community Foundation is also going to administer a fund called Neighbor to Neighbor, which is really just for individuals. So if any of you have spare money, <laughs> give it to the, the Community Foundation, and that goes directly to individuals, and they'll be administering that. Thanks. If only we had had a member, a, uh, somebody from the Longmont Community Foundation who had been on the line and spoke during the public invited to be heard. <laughs> so many of these questions could have been answered. Okay. Uh, that no is shaming, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Simply reflecting the possibilities, Eric. Okay, any other questions or comments, feedback for Kathy?
Okay, I, I think Kathy, everybody seems to be in pretty widespread approval of your reallocations and, and redirection of money. Okay, great. I will convey that to council. I think it makes sense. Good. Great, thank you. Okay, we're on to agenda item six, update on human services need assessment and review 2021 human service funding options. Alberto is going to walk us through that. Meeting board. Uh, before jumping into the presentation, I did want to give an update that I just got today, and I have not had a chance to send it out to the board for your information from um, Root Policy, who is the consultants that are doing the human services needs assessment. Uh, they just sent me the timeline, um, and so I. You know, their, their goal is to really start um, stakeholder uh, engagement and stakeholder, by stakeholder engagement, they're really talking about agencies that serve low and moderate income residents in, in services in Longmont. And they're thinking about doing that the weeks, week, the weeks of June 2nd and 8th, uh, doing uh, several focus groups um, they may reach out or they would like to reach out starting May 26th or June 5th, uh, potential residential right, resident focus group host um, to gauge interest on hosting virtual resident engagement. Um, and then doing that through the June 8th through the 30th and July 1st to July 31st, really developing the human services needs draft um, for in preparation for a board presentation in August. Um, so I just received that timeline today and I want to share that with the board. Um, but now we can, um, Susan, if you, if you don't mind, we could jump into the presentation. Uh, we want to have, we want to get some, as Karen mentioned earlier, we want to get some direction from the board around the 2021 human agency service funding um, just because of uh, the reality of COVID and what that will mean for human services funding. So uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide, one more please. So as you can imagine, uh, COVID-19 crisis has impacted um, several essential components of the human service funding in particular we don't know yet in complete detail what this crisis, how it's going to impact of our, our available funding for 2021. And of course, we, I just shared you the timeline to complete the human services needs assessment. Uh, that was not our original goal to be finishing in August. We were hoping to be finishing closer to this meeting, actually. Um, and of course, this has not happened. So this, of course, puts us in a situation where we have to rethink what we do for 2021. Susan, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. So just as a, as a reminder, um, this is what was allocated uh, in 2020. Uh, 789,000 uh, uh, was to the human services and 815 was around homelessness and homelessness prevention work through the Arts Center, the Home Study Program. Susan, can you move to the next one, please? One more. So for some of our new members, uh, just a quick background. So in 2018, this board decided um, to align our human services needs assessment with the con plan that uh, Kathy has been talking about. And this would really uh, help us coordinate resources and timeframes in doing this community-wide assessments. Uh, so that the board thought it was a good idea to put these in alignment. And so we started that process. So we do have some human services needs information now uh, that was part of uh, getting the comp plan, but, the, but, but we wanted a little deeper dive. And so this is why we have extended our contract with Root Policy and are working on a, on a much um, in-depth uh, human services needs assessment. So um, one more slide, please. 
So we're about to jump into the options where we're gonna ask for some feedback from the board. A few things that you need, the board needs to be contemplating as we look at this. Again, reiterating that we don't know what the final financial impact is um, in 2021. Also, while we're, we are not sure, we believe that this impact will likely suspend council's decision to of the incremental percentage increase to human service funding. Uh, Karen, I think we were at, we were going to be going up to 2.75 in 2021 is my understanding. Um, and the human services needs assessment will not be complete in time for an early summer release. We were hoping to release the RFP if everything was going as planned. We were going to release it in June after our May meeting. Um, and the other thing to consider is our EC Impact Partners. EC Impact, for those that don't know, is how we is how we, we run the application process. It's an online uh, platform that agencies use to fill out the application and we use to uh, review and um, also judge the applications where uh, board members get to score and we use those scores to help us determine what final allocations are. Um, they already have, City of Boulder for sure has already has a plan to suspend their annual RFP due to COVID impacts. So we know that for sure. We're not sure what Boulder County is gonna do. I think they're waiting on us and what our direction will be before making a final decision. So those are things to keep in mind as we go through these options and then we can have a conversation. Um, so you wanna go to the next slide, Susan? So uh, there's four options I wanna go over pretty quickly and then we can have a conversation. Option one is simple. We know that we're not gonna have the new priorities are, uh, set, um, but we could decide that, that we are just gonna go ahead with what our 2020 priorities are, uh, the percentages that we had placed on them, um, and just you know release an RFP that way. Things to consider is that, again, I know for a fact that City of Boulder is not planning to, to release an RFP. I did talk to City of Boulder and they're willing to support us if we decide to go this option um, with the EC Impact process. I am not an expert at EC Impact, but the City of Boulder has some folks that could help me. Uh, we would need to figure out how we would do this process, in particular around the hearings. Would they be virtual? You know, all of these things we'd have to figure out pretty quickly. Uh, as, as staff and as a board. Could you go to the option two? So option two, we could postpone the 2021 application until fall. Uh, we are expected to get our final um, human services needs assessment done by August. Um, and really the things to consider is how late would we be comfortable releasing the application to provide recommendations to council. Karen did tell me that it doesn't have to be in December, it could be after. Uh, it's just been traditionally been in December, but there's no, there's no regular saying it has to be that way. Um, and, and I think just to clarify that, uh, that the council authorizes the amount set aside for human service funding as part of their budget process. So that amount would be um, allocated and available. And then, you know, so, but we could wait another couple of months and go back to council if this is how we want to. Um, distribute the money, but the money would be allocated in the um, in the early fall. And again, as in the first option, we may be, may be proceeding without our partners as far as, you know, um, the EC impact system. And of course, we'd have to rework our hearing and schedule our hearing, our hearings and schedule it to meet tight deadlines. So Susan, can you go next to option three? So option three is we the board could just recommend that staff uh, just continue the 2020 contracts and modify the scopes of, sir of work based on funding availability. Um, this would provide time for the human services needs to be completed and allow it to be considered for 22, 2022 funding. There has been precedent. This has happened, um, at least as far as I know, it's happened at least once. Yeah, I happen to have 
partook of that one where I just renewed my contract with the city of Longmont. Uh, so that it has happened in the past. Um, so that that is an, uh, another option that we could do. And then finally, Susan, you get to the fourth option. So this is a this this option is a little different, but it, it could go in line with with option three. Um, this would be um, the board asking us as staff to use the information that we've been gathering. And I'm going to share a little bit in a little bit. I don't I don't think you're going to be able to see it, but I do have some recent survey results from our funded agencies. Um, and really respond to the COVID uh, piece with the information that we've gotten. And funding could be redirected from current agencies that are not meeting emerging needs. So the idea would be what needs are coming up that are coming uh, out of this COVID crisis that we want to fund. Um, so this could help us address some of the emerging needs that we're seeing. I can tell you that, that the city of Boulder is looking at a model like that, potentially creating a logic model saying here are the activities and outcomes that we want to see based on what we're learning uh, during this COVID emergency. Um, some of these we got to consider is, do we want to create a new hearing process or a new, a new um, some type of uh, another, if not an RFP, some other process to do it? Or would we want to, um, we want to negotiate the contracts. Um, so those are things to consider. We want to create a separate process based on the emerging needs. Um, and there's a lot of questions that are not on here that we need to answer as well. But, you know, I think it's a way that we could address the needs, um, but it would look different than what we've done in the past. So we could also combine option four and three um, to say, you know, within our funded agencies right now, we want to look at those that are meeting the needs that are emerging um, and just renegotiate the contracts that way without having to open another process, um, asking agencies to, to apply and explain how they're meeting this emerging needs. So that's, I guess that's the fifth option. It's combining those two. So those are the four options that we've created. Susan, if you want to move on to the next one, if you all have any other thoughts, we could, we could also entertain those as well tonight. Um, I think what we're looking for tonight more than anything is direction on where the board wants us to, to uh, do more research into, look into what the possibilities are. Um, yeah, that's, that's what we're asking for tonight. So I think that that's it. There's the next slide is just a question slide. Um, so I think we can turn this off, Susan, and, and, and jump into the discussion. Can I ask a question? Please, Ann. Would we, I'm more interested in, in number four, just because I'd like the money to go to the highest needs, but would we know who's received funding, extra funding or whatever through this process? <clears throat> because I think that some agencies probably, you know, have benefited by donations and others have not at all. So would we that's know a, who? That's a, well, that's a great question. Well, we, so Karen and I and Eric, who's on the phone too, we are part of the Boulder County uh, Funders Collaborative. And while we don't know private funding, um, we, uh, the most local government and foundation funding, we've been, we created what we call a master tracker. Uh, a, a very large spreadsheet that has uh, tracked uh, where funding has gone. So for example, uh, in the city of Longmont, what we did is we didn't have any extra funding, but we were willing and able to uh, expedite uh, second and third quarter payments, fourth quarter payments that needed to agencies that needed uh, the funding upfront. And we've released some funding early for some of these agencies who have dealt with some um, you know, immediate needs, increasing demand and, and um, you know, just lack of resources. So we have released some of their funding early. Uh, but, you know, the neighbor to neighbor fund that the community foundation, um, they've released 185,000 so far to agencies. Uh, Boulder County Community Foundation, I think has released, um, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's in the realm around three or $400,000 um so 
um, we do know some of that, but we, you know, when it comes to private donations, that's a, we, we don't know uh, what, what that, um, what some agents are receiving and others are not. Karen, do you want to? So I, I think, um, yeah, so I think as El Alberto mentioned, so we have this big mother spreadsheet, this big master spreadsheet. Um, so we are tracking like all the federal dollars that have come through the, um, the county. So, so we are tracking where are those funds uh, going and who's receiving those. So we will have, we'll have all that information, you know, other than what Ellie Bridge mentioned in terms of any private donations that's come in directly to the agencies. But we have a pretty good system of tracking all the rest of it. One of the things that's been frustrating for me is that just, you know, when I go to, if I, go to do a donation somewhere is I have no idea, like does the hour center, are they flush au comité, you know, who, where is the need? Um, it's just difficult and I, I just would like the money to go to the places that can use it the most, I guess. Yeah. I think the other thing that I would like add, I add to that, Anne, is that um, we have also been uh, distributing or asking agencies to give us feedback from surveys and saying, you know, what are, what are your needs? What are you struggling with? So we actually have a lot of data at our disposal that we've been tracking around, you know, which, which agencies are, are struggling in what, um, what areas. And just as a, as an example with the, with the, um, the family resource centers, um, so we, we kind of have an idea of, and they've indicated how much money that they have available for, say, direct financial assistance. And, and, and so you can really see who has been more successful in raising additional monies. And actually, it's the, our center that we've had uh, chats about is, is probably the agency that has the smallest amount of money available right now for individual assistance needs. So, so we, do, we do have a lot of data and um, that can help inform the advisory board if you wanted to go with this option that helps to focus money on the impact of the pandemic. Um, we do have a lot of data at our, at our disposal that will help inform that. It just would be so nice if they put that in the paper for just regular people that want to you know, help with this or that, you know, it's very confusing. Like even if it's $25 or bring some food or whatever, um, it just, it's not really been there. And I think it's a missed opportunity. Thank you, Anne. So let's go with Jake and then council member Christensen. Just a quick question, Karen uh, Eliberto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, are we just on that big spreadsheet you mentioned, are we just tracking agencies that we've funded or applicants, or are we tracking every dollar that comes down from to nonprofits from the feds? So, you know, we're tracking, um, again, we're tracking the, the, the dollars that have, that have come through the CARES Act to say the Boulder County government. So also we're tracking the, our CDBG, CV dollars, we're tracking the, the additional dollars that have come through for TANF and, um, you know, for the SNAP, the nutrition program, for rapid rehousing. So, um, so the monies over which Boulder County, City of Boulder, City of Longmont, the Boulder Community Foundation and the Longmont Community Foundation, those are the dollars that we are tracking. Great, thank you. I was just curious if we were we were, we're tracking everything, it sounds like, not just the 25 or some odd funded agencies we had. Every, everything that's coming through, right. Great, right. thank you. Thank you. Polly? Sorry. Um, I, I guess I, I see what you're doing. I like the fact that you're giving us four choices. Um, I think there's a great deal of money coming in from hither and yon that has to do with COVID. For the sake of the agencies, I 
think it would be best to go with number one so that they, they don't have to stress out on top of everything else that they're going to lose their funding because of whatever, you know, every year, this is incredibly stressful for them. And um, I think uh, there are organizations that may not be appearing to be uh, affected by COVID, but I think virtually every single human service agency and provider is going to be stressed out by this. I would suggest that we just go with this so that they know that they are going to have, we hope, um, what they had last year. And then they can apply for extra funding uh, and grants um, to, um, to different agencies that are doing that. Uh, for example, um, you know, most of these agencies have fundraisers. Our center has a big fundraiser. Hope has a big fundraiser. Um, El Comité has a big fundraiser. They had to call that off. So they have no, <laughs> no big excites, ex, you know, no big bucks coming. And meanwhile, what they're dealing with is people who, um, a household will come in, two members of that household have already died of uh, COVID. They're living together because some of them lost their jobs. Um, they are, because these are jobs that are maybe gig economy, they're not gonna be eligible probably for um, the $1,200 help or the unemployment or any of this stuff. So people are living, people who are low income are, are in this community and everywhere else in this country, uh, particularly minority people are losing are much more highly impacted by this. And the service agencies that do that are uh, working even harder. And so I would suggest that we just give them a break and say, okay, we're just gonna fund you the way we did last year, if we can, and we'll, we'll deal with it next year. But here are these other agencies, other places you can get supplementary funds for all the stuff that you're doing relative to COVID. Focusing on COVID for the next two years is, to me, um, kind of short-sighted. I mean, I, <laughs> I know it's a big, serious thing, but it will not last forever. And then we will have made a commitment of money to something that we don't know from day to day what's, how this is going to play out. So, so that's just my opinion. Polly, well, let me just answer, Polly. Did, do you mean number one or number, that sounded more like number three where we just. Oh, all right. The, the one contracts. where we, we said, I don't have your slides right here. Um, the one where we said we will, um, just for this year, we're not gonna review you. We're gonna give you what we did last year. Right, depending on three? funding availability. Okay. Okay, so let, let's do this. Um, so Anne. Graham, and then I, I would like to hear from some of the board members who haven't weighed in on some of these issues. Uh, Karen and Deanna, if you could um, think about it, if you have questions as well. So go ahead, Anne. I just wonder, and maybe this is just thinking outside of the box or the responsibilities we have, but you know, I stopped giving any money recently because. I don't know who to give it to. And it just, I don't know if there's some way that the city or the county or someone could say, these are the agencies. Like I, I understand what um, Polly is saying that, yes, I mean, I, I get that now that if we want to take all the money away from all those agencies, they won't be up and running. So I, I can understand that part of it. But for me, just as a citizen, I don't know who to give my $25 or my $100 to because there's no one that says these are the agencies that are really hurting. And maybe just creating that along with what we're going to do, I don't know. So, I just like that. Like these are the agencies like El Comité or whoever it may be that really does need help. And then maybe, I guess we can't track that because it's private, but 
I just, that's frustrating for me, not knowing who's flush with money and not. So echoing Brian's statement, if only we had somebody from the Longmont Community Foundation that talks to these agencies on a daily basis, knows what they're going through. So I, on that note, Alberto, I, uh, is there any reason we can't invite Eric to weigh in on some of these issues after we've all had our discussion? I, I'm unaware of any procedural elements that would prevent that. I think that's up to the, the chair to determine. So if you okay. want to invite, invite comment, I think that's fine. I, I know the chair pretty well, so we'll probably do that. Uh, so let's go with Graham and then Karen and then Deanna. Hey, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I feel like there has to be some kind of process of accountability to check in with these organizations before we give them money. I'm, I'm fine with using last year's sort of priorities as a good baseline and not sort of overreacting to the COVID thing and restructuring human service funding. But I do think there needs to be some manner of check-in, some application process. I think we should probably try to simplify it, you know, make it simpler on the organization that's going to be stressed and us and not try to force this, um, this what was it, the EICU system. Um, and certainly give them an opportunity to, to to voice increased needs as a result of COVID. But um, yeah, I, my vote is to have some kind of application process still in place. I guess my question about the postponing is one, is that gonna help organizations that might otherwise struggle to meet the deadline? And two, would postponing the application process postpone them receiving the funds? So if the organizations are injured by postponing, I would not vote for that. But if there's no net negative impact on the, the nonprofits by postponing, I, my vote is to postpone, have an application and review process using you know, technology or not at the time, it doesn't matter. But yeah, that's what I got, thanks. Thank you, Graham. Karen? Well, I'm just kind of, I don't know how this works. I don't know how you know, so until I have something to base this on, I'm not even sure what's going on, you know, as far okay. as how we make a decision. And, and so this kind of new to me and I don't quite have anything to base this on. So I'm not sure. Okay, that, that's fair. So if you, if there are specific questions, um, so I, I would only invite you to think about how we could help make sure that you have your questions answered so that, you know, as you move along, it'll be a little bit clearer. Uh, but I completely understand that position. Dina? Uh, I guess, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this, but I am sort of wondering if staff who prepared these options have an opinion on which of these make the most sense in a couple of different ways. First of all, what's workable from the staff perspective and from a board perspective and um, what makes the most sense in terms of satisfying needs of these organizations? And um, to echo both what Graham and Polly said, I am concerned also about making sure that organizations that really, really need the money right now actually get the money. But I also know that probably they're spinning right now trying to get everything taken care of. And maybe if we can delay application without delaying receipt of money, it, that does make sense to me. But I don't know if that's workable from a board perspective. Thank you. So just for my own input, uh, I also have a concern about the loss of continuity in what agencies are providing and, and those are underlying foundational needs that we've identified in the community. And, um, you know, as, as soon as we break that continuity, it really puts future risk for these foundational ongoing needs. So I, I almost see this more like a, uh, this kind of weird like uh, chart almost where there's these needs that we've identified and, and I think COVID is actually gonna, the, the impacts are very much in alignment with what agencies are already providing, right? It's just more. We need more housing, we need more healthcare, we need more mental health services, whatever it is. Um, so I wonder, Alberto and Karen, if it makes sense to consider just if we can identify some of those areas that have clearly increased needs, 
not that they're the only, uh, it, maybe that just helps us identify if like, you know, this agency, that need isn't quite as high as this need is temporarily. So we move a little bit, but we still figure out what that critical mass is to maintain that continuity. Uh, that's a pretty big theoretical ask, but I'm just trying to visualize it in a way that that makes sense. I keep thinking of the organization that does the visitations with uh, children and their parents. Uh, I forget what the organization. Children first at the Rockies. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's one of those things that it, it's like that need is it's there through all circumstances, and it's such a critical function that it, it's hard for me to think about displacing that and and underfunding and, and allowing children to maintain that contact in a safe manner. And we just need more money, but it's going to be a pretty nuanced, I think. Yes, so, oh, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I, I think um, just to, I would echo what Graham has said. Um, I think the concerns that Councilwoman um, Christensen had about um, the stress on these organizations, I think that the idea of um, delaying uh, the applications and then doing a, a simplified process for these organizations so that we continue to have some measure of oversight or accountability on them. Um, but also recognizing that like getting them to maybe put together a full package when they're trying to apply for five other grants to supplant, you know, to supplement them because they can't do their usual annual fundraiser. Like that's a lot that's on their plate trying to find ways to do that. Um, I think that that makes the most sense um, is to try to find a way to do that, um, reducing the burden, but also making sure that we're not just sort of like handing funds. Um, I would also be somewhat curious if, uh, you know, if we wait till the fall, um, whether there are any of these organizations that don't that don't make it. Um, and I don't mean that in a, like, I'm not trying to be pessimistic about that, but I do think that we're in a very unique time and that some of these organizations, um, you know, some of the smaller ones, some of the smaller amounts that we've given may not. Um, and so continuing the funds maybe doesn't make sense from that sense, but also understanding like if there are organizations that are essentially going to be wrapping down um, their operations, um, letting us be sort of agile to respond to some of that. Um, Thank you, Caitlin. Karen? Uh, so I guess what I am hearing, or I just wanted to check, is that it, it, it sounds like that the advisory board is, is interested in um, releasing some kind of application process uh, for, um, so that gives everyone a, a shot at being able to ask for um, ask for money, not just say we're we're just gonna we're gonna change our priorities because that's the thing I heard you talk about, Brian, was that we could certainly look at some priority shifts. Doesn't mean that we wouldn't consider some agencies that maybe were in a lower price, but we would kind of move our um, our weighting and our priorities a little mm -hmm. bit. So it sounds like there's still some interest in doing a, a competitive application process um, and not just continuing what we had in 2020 into 2021 and not just focusing on COVID. So if, I, if I'm hearing correctly. And, and then I think really the question is um, if, if, if you want to have application process, might it make sense for us to schedule that application process later in the year, we will, we will have a, a few more months of, of finding out how, um, what our world is continuing to look like with uh, recovery from, uh, working on a recovery from, um, from the pandemic. Plus, if in August that we will have our, our updated needs assessment information, then that gives us a chance to kind of look at a whole a whole picture and and reset what we think our priorities um, we want those those to be the um, the 
the question about how much longer if we went if we if we waited until the fall to release our, our application and go through that process, probably what would happen is that it would be it would take a little while longer for us to get their 2021 applications and contracts. Um, it, it might be a month or two delay in, in getting the contracts in order. But you know we would work really hard to um, to move that along. So it, it sounds like that there's a desire to have some application process. And so whether that is based, basing that on the you know the previous uh, target areas or whether you want to uh, wait a, um, you know a, a couple three months and have it incorporate the new um, needs assessment data that we are collecting. Jake and then Council Member Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Karen. I think you're you're hearing us right. I do have one thing that I just wanted to mention. I'm I'm seeing every day um, that there is a lot of money going out because of COVID. There's there's a lot of money connected to um, to to the virus. A good chunk of that, probably the vast majority of it, is going to the for-profit sector, right? Going to support small business, going through. Although nonprofits can apply for PPP, can there there's a there's a blend there. I think ultimately what this process is in the human services funding is it's designed to support nonprofit agencies who are meeting community need here in the city of Longmont. So from my perspective, for this one very unique funding cycle, I think it would be a mistake for us to not in some way incorporate COVID into that conversation. Um, I, I, I came into this kind of very much set on option four, but I think Council Member Christensen made a great point, which is we need to support agencies that, that are continuing to, that are, that are having a hard time. So my preference, just to get it out, would be that we do an application process, that we delay that application process until we can get um, the human services needs assessment back but that that process also in some part of the matrix, it doesn't have to be the number one priority. It doesn't have to be anywhere. I would like agencies to be able to at least communicate to us how they're dealing with the COVID, how, they, how they're addressing need in the community. And then we can decide as a board how we wanna weigh that into the overall decision on funding. That's ultimately our, our decision. So. I think it would be delay the application process, absolutely have an application process. Graham is 100% right. I do not want to just extend contracts um, without being able to check in with some of these folks. Some of those agencies were right on the right on the line, and I want to see how folks are doing. I think Caitlin has a great point about, you know, seeing where folks are at in two to three months. So I think my preference would be you delay it, you incorporate COVID into the overall picture of funding without necessarily totally changing the structure um, and make sure that's part of the application. And then we as a board do a, do a competitive funding process. So that's my, I that's agree. Great. great. Council member Christensen. Um, yes. I like what Jake said. It's um to just include as part of the application process a question on, on what their how COVID has impacted them in their provision of services and what their new needs are. Um, I also want to remind people, though, if we delay it too much, um, these agencies are using our funding to get leverage for other funding. So if we delay it, then they they can't apply for anything else because they can't say that, yeah, we got this amount of funding from the, the city of Longmont. And so when we delay things too long, it's gonna cause them uh, yet more stress and <laughs> more economic problems. So let's try not to delay it too long. Right. Yeah, and I guess to council member uh, Christensen's point. So, I mean, I think what, what that would look like is probably the earliest because we have the needs assessment data and then you know we have to go through the process of waiting and, and what are gonna be our priorities. So, so it, it's, it's probably a, Ellie Burcho, I'm just making a guess that it's probably um, you know, a, a mid to late September release 
of that um, of that RFP. Um, so before before Jay, just really quickly. Um, so something that would change, though, I mean, in what I'm hearing, and that would help, is a simplified, you know, um, application process, where we may or may not use EC Impact. We use something else that's easier. Um, you know, so that would also help speed up the process if we're not doing the full on grant application that we do through um, EC Impact. So that's just something to throw out there to think about. Not that we couldn't do EC Impact, I'm just talking about how could, if we could simplify it, that would speed up the process. And we also think about, we also think about the, the um, hearings as well. Uh, you know, that would also, if, if we remove that or modify it to make it easier, then that would also speed up the process because that does take time. All right, Jake, thank you, Alberto. Just a quick, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I, think, I think it's a simplified application um, that includes kind of, you're probably gonna have to restructure a good deal of the logic model um, to incorporate COVID and also to way shrink it down. Um, and then also I think a hearing process that is as much as it is hard on us, perhaps, um, to condense it and kind of stack it Instead of I don't know how long how many how long it took us to get through hearings last year uh, you know a, a month basically of, of of once a week long hearings maybe we condense that down and say can we get these done in two weeks or what have you and then I mean I I'm curious from as a question as well from because Councilmember Christian again makes a great point from Karen or Alberto what the timeline would be for us for when we needed to have the process done so that we're not having that negative impact on our agencies. Um, what, what, when roughly would, like, when do they need to have that info? I, mean, I know it's kind of all up in the air, but I'm curious. About well, I guess how I would answer that, um, Jake, is that if, if tonight, if the advisory board wanted to give us direction on where you would like to head with this, then we would come back to you in the, all these months are just rolling together at the June meeting and, uh, and, and we could flesh out more details. So I think really what we're looking for is, is, is there one option you really want, one or two that you want us to pursue? We could then come back with, um, with more detail about what that would look like. Great, I think I've, I think I've said my, my piece. My, I think people kind of get a sense for where I'm at with it. I think that's the approach that makes the most sense. So is that, does that, if everybody understands that, that's where I'm at. So thanks. Thank you, Jay. Caitlin? I have two questions, and I'm not sure exactly where to direct them, but um, the first is um, regarding waiting for the human, um, for the needs assessment. Um, what I heard was that, that if we want to take that into account, we have to wait until we get that to determine, to actually put out the RFP for these. Is that actually a blocker? Do we have to have that needs assessment before we can ask agencies and tell agencies that we're accepting applications? So I, I think that's really up to, so that's really the difference between uh, option one and option two. So uh, option one is release an application, use the same uh, funding priorities as we have the last three years. And option two is, is have an application process, but use the new funding priorities from, from the assessment. And then plus the, e so either one of those, you could incorporate the, the, the COVID impact questions. So it's really about, do you want to, where we'd be a couple of months away from having fresh data about the needs in Longmont. So do you want to wait for that for a couple of months or you want to move forward with the, with the, the data that is is about three and a half years old. And so that's really are, the change. Are those priorities incorporated in the application process to help applicants understand what the priorities are um, and how we're weighting them? Is that the, the gist of it, is that we sort of have to specify what those priorities are to allow them to customize their applications accordingly? It, it's really for you to determine how, when you look at what are the needs in the community, um, what are we going to ask uh, for, um, for 
what do we want to fund? We want to fund services that target X, Y. We had six areas of need that came out of the last needs assessment. So this is really to inform you as the advisory board, what are the most critical um, and compelling needs in our community that we think the, um, these dollars that we're responsible for should be invested in. And then, okay. it, and then that informs what the application looks like and the areas that we are considering funding. Um, so my follow-up question to that is, do we have a sense from any of the draft or the information that we have so far, if there is a, any kind of dramatic shift in what those are or would be? Because it seems to me like those areas that we've talked about that are the needs, I could see maybe them shuffling a little bit in terms of like which one is the top one, but not necessarily something, one of those six things dropping off completely and being replaced by some need that we have not um, previously prioritized. Um. So I would say, and Eliberto, maybe I have not done a deep dive into the, I mean, there are pages and pa the good news is we have over a thousand respondents to the surveys. There's a lot of data. Pages. There's a lot of data in there. So I can't answer that question yet. But the thing that we are interested in um, that we had to wait on because of the pandemic is the focus groups. So we will have the data, but the, the additional work that we are contracting um, group policy to do is to really help us dive in a little deeper and try to get the story behind the data that really helps inform what are the types of services that we might want to be funding. Um, so it just, it makes the data richer by um, helping our community members interpret what that really means. Got it. Um, the second question that I had um, was when we were talking about this, about the hearing process. Um, and I'm curious if we have the ability to, um, for example, um, not, I guess if we have to condense it down to change who we hear from. So for example, if an agency comes in and is sort of like, everything's basically the same, we're meeting the same needs, everything is fine, like we're asking for the same amounts, do we necessarily need to hear from those folks or the folks where it's changing a lot? Um, do we have the ability to sort of um, make that determination or do we have to hear from everybody um, as part of that process? So uh, this is Karen again. So I would say that uh, it, the, the hearing process is really uh, up to the advisory board to, um, to determine. I would say that um, for consistency sake, again, um, that because these are, these are city and tax dollars, that, that whatever you decide to ap apply in terms of your funding process that you really um, do that um, consistently and equitably among the agencies. How you um, how you want to do that and the process you want to develop is really up to you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So we are running out of time, Deanna. Just quickly, I'm not sure I really understood the answer to this question, but in terms of delaying the application impacting the receipt of funds by organizations. If we delay the application by a couple of months, are we automatically delaying the receipt of funds by a couple of months? Or can we compact the hearing process and maybe the gathering of information through the application process sufficiently to sort of offset that delay? Or is it just unavoidable from a staff perspective that that delay is gonna happen? You know, if you give us some direction, we, we will certainly look at that. Most of the, um, the, the challenge is, I mean, is in the contracting process. So it, it takes a while because we have to create individual scopes of work for each of the individual agencies. There's a negotiation back and forth. Then, it, then we get every contract review by our city attorney's office. So it just takes us a little while to move through that. We do that as fast as we can, but we're not the only ones that have a hand in that. So it depends on how fast the agencies get back to us. Um, and sometimes that doesn't, we have to wait in terms of you know their work and then our attorney's office also has to approve all the contracts. But, so that's really, it, it takes, it takes a, a little while to, um, to once we get the approval from council that they're good with the, what we're recommending. 
Um, and it doesn't mean that we can't expedite it on the front end. So we can certainly work in the front end with the boilerplate contract with our attorneys for 2021. That we could get done early. And then it's really just around the negotiation of the scopes of work for each of the individual agencies. And like this year we had, I don't know, 30, 35 contracts. So it just, it just takes a little, it takes a little while. So that's, that, if that helps. Thank you, Karen. Jake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, just to, for clarification, do you need a motion and a vote on one of these options? Is that what staff is asking for? You're Karen, you're unmuted. unmuted. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was unmuted and I booted. Yes, we would okay. like some direction. Okay, I, I'm gonna put this out. Okay, so I, I, I feel like because we had so many people, so many of our residents, become a part of the survey process because we would be a couple of months out from getting new data, which we don't know if it's going to be substantially different or not at this point. We need to make a decision now. I want to go ahead and move uh, option two, which would be to delay um, with the assumption and the belief that there will be some COVID element as a part of that application, um, as a part of the overall application. So that's that's my motion, and I'll look for a second. All right, is there a second, Deanna? Okay, we have a second. Uh, okay, so discussion. Any discussion on the motion? Anne? How far are you saying to delay? Because that concerns me. I, it was all right, Mr. Chair, if I, yeah. Um, I would uh, think that delay makes sense on like as soon as we get that data back that as expedient as staff finds possible once we have the human services needs assessment in our hands to get that application done get it out begin the process so i'm not talking about waiting i, I would put some power in staff's hands at that point to say all right we have this data back let's move on it include some COVID elements in the applications and then get it out to our agencies. So as expediently as possible after the receipt of the human services assessment. You know, and, and what I would add to that is what would be, what, what we're really looking at is some direction from you in, in terms of what option we're really gonna flesh out and then bring back to you in June with more details. And then mm -hmm. that point in time you can say, ah, ah, we don't wanna do that, we wanna do this. So, but, but to have at least a narrowing of options yeah. Um, that we could, you know, flesh out and bring back to you is what we're looking for. Not that you're totally committed to that. Okay. So, uh, for my part of the discussion, I would add just, I think, along the lines of what you were saying, Karen, that we're, we're agreed we're going to pursue an, an application process, a simplified application that will incorporate COVID-19 questions. Jake, I think you covered that in your motion. And uh, I would suggest amending the language to include uh, that the direction, the direction includes staff developing uh, timeline benchmarks for opening applications, closing, uh, and seeing how much elasticity there is in that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also just as a comment, I wonder, Karen, with the contracts, you know, I think the, the interviews we need to do, it's possible for those agencies that have existing contracts this year that maybe that could be a way we could expedite that process is if the, the scope of work changes, but the contract language remains the same. That, that's just a curiosity. And, and what I would say, Brian, is that the contract, the boilerplate contract language doesn't really significantly change yeah. from year to year. It's really in the individual review and, um, and okay. negotiation, and, but it, it doesn't change significantly. Okay unless there's some big change in insurance requirements or, you know, or, or some kind of uh, change in, in the law, but it, it doesn't change much. Okay, so any other discussion on the motion on the I, table? Jake? 
I would just say that's a brilliant uh, point on benchmark timelines, Mr. Chair. I happily accept that as a friendly. Um, so, so for right. so I think that's a great idea. Nicole, were you able to capture that? Sorry, my um, space bar isn't working to unmute me. I apologize. Um, yes, I believe I have it. So um, basically option two, delay until the needs assessment funding priorities with the assumption and belief that there'll be a COVID element as part of the application and also a request for staff to develop a timeline benchmarks for opening and closing along with elasticity in that. And I would include a simplified application, please. Oh, yes. Great, thank you. Okay, You're let's welcome. take a vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. I got you guys. Thank you. Any opposed, raise your hand. Okay, the motion passes, thank you. So we have, uh, I think the site visit updates we should table until our next meeting. The update on Longmont Housing Authority, Karen, is that uh, something you'd like to cover quickly? And I do want to invite Eric to just answer a few of the questions if he chooses to do so. So, um, so Mr. Chair, that is that is certainly up to you. It was a request of one of the advisory board members that we give an update on um, on really what's what's happening with the Longmont Housing Authority. So. Mm -hmm. You can Let's tell me it. if you want me to move forward or not. If you say make it 10 minutes, make it five minutes. I can't know if I can make it five minutes, but I can probably make it 10 minutes. So whatever you want, whatever you want me to do. Let's, let's do it in 10 minutes. Hey, you want, you want to do your timer? <laughs> well, it would give me some sense of purpose. Susan, if you would pull up the PowerPoint, that would be fabulous. And you can go to the next slide, please. So, um, so, so basically, the the, um, the the background is that we had um, the the city and the Lama Housing Authority had been in conversation since the beginning part of this year about creating some kind of a, a different partnership between the two entities. Um, you know, Jillian Baldwin, the director, came in about um, less than two years ago after the Longmont Housing Authority went through, uh, you know, kind of a, a crisis. And, and she had really, um, she, she had worked really hard to try to uh, stabilize the Longmont Housing Authority. She made some great strides. Um, and, and, the, the process for continuing to do that and the kind of issues that continue to come up and the, the, you know, the, the challenges of the agency that she was not seeing a sustainable path for the Lama Housing Authority um, in without some kind of major um, examination or shifts or changes in the system and, and how it, it, it did business. Um, so we were in conversations with um, you know, with the Lama Housing Authority about that. We had uh, started to put a plan together, Kathy and, and me with our city manager. We had, in, you know, we had had talks with the boards, um, with our city council. And, um, and, and that, that discussion with the board, with the Lama Housing Authority and Lama Housing Development Corporation Board happened that first week in March. And you know what happened the second week in March. So, so we, so that work really took, went on the side burner until Jillian um, announced the end of April that she, um, that she had accepted a, another position and she would be leaving the Longmont Housing Authority. So we jumped back in with warp speed around this, this work that we started. So we, we looked at, so this is, this slide is really, this is the vision of our city council. Um, 
of, in terms of where they see their focus and the need to make sure that folks have ad adequate access to housing. Next slide, please. This is the Longmont um, Housing Authority's vision to be the leader in providing affordable housing. And the next slide is, um, this is the work that we, we, we probably worked pretty um, intensely in February to, to really look at what are the challenges that are, are experienced, that the Longmont Housing Authority was experiencing. And what you see in front of you is, is really a list of things that we identified in February, which really had to do with um, their staff capacity. They continue to have staff turnover. Um, they, they don't have enough ongoing revenue really coming in from their business model that, that allows them to probably have all of the staff that they really need to have to provide the services that they, um, they provide. We identified um, challenges within the organizational culture, within the culture of their residential facilities that really needed to be addressed. Uh, the need for the housing authority to have a really a future vision for where it, where it really needed to be and what kind of support sustainable structure needed to be in place for them to reach their vision. We wanted to look at more um, ongoing development opportunities and really expansion opportunities. And expansion opportunities really has to do with the um, expansion of their housing choice voucher program. So there are opportunities, you know, uh, along the way for, for housing authorities to apply for additional, um, what we used to call the old section eight housing choice, the housing vouchers. Now they're called housing choice vouchers, but because the, um, the, the housing authorities just kind of trying to keep their head above water. Um, they just really haven't been able to focus on the pursuit of new development opportunities, expansion opportunities that bring in more revenue that allows them to do their jobs better, right? Um, and then the fourth, the fifth bullet is really about looking for an opportunity to better integrate the work that the city is doing and the housing authority on um, on the affordable housing goals and strategies that are coming out of the regional housing partnership. Next slide, please, Susan. And so this was the vision that we created back in the first part of March that we shared with the, um, with the housing authority board. Um, and I won't read this all to you, but it was really about an integrated partnership model so that we could leverage resources and we could continue to have a continuum of housing opportunities available to our, our, um, to our community. Next slide, please. So, um, so we, these are the, we went through and we identified what are the things that we really need to focus on in the next, um, the, basically the next five, six months. And this is work that we did since, um, whatever, end of April. So, so we really looked at operations as a, is one of the big issues. So we need to, and in there is really um, looking at staff development, staff training needs for the housing authority, you know, making sure that we have all the different kinds of protocols and policies and things in place. There are, um, as well as looking at how they are in compliance with all their federal funds, um, HUD, you know what that looks like for CDBG. So making sure that we're in compliance with that and really looking at what would be the optimum staffing levels that the housing authority needs to have to, um, to really perform their work well. Next slide, please. This is another area that we said we wanted to look at is both in terms of their organization culture and their residential culture. Um, so that it is, uh, so that instead of, fighting fires and problems and conflicts that we are figuring out how to shift to a more positive way um, of the residents for living together and the, for, and the staff for working together that really propels the agency forward rather than keeps, us, it keeps them in a crisis mode. Next slide, please. 
And then, um, and then to really look at a couple of development opportunities. So uh, I think, as you all know, is in terms of we are looking at the the, re, um, the refinancing and rehab of the Aspen Meadows apartments. Um, and so that pro we knew that um, we had to work on that, make sure that that was successful, and, and figuring out our project management of that without Jillian in um, in in that role. And then we also have a, 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 a property. Um, it's really the other, the undeveloped portion of the suites property that the city was 51% in um, owner in. Um, and so we are working with uh, Ele Element is the uh, is the development group. And so we have um, they submitted a tax credit um, application and to develop that parcel on the suites. And so we should hear back about whether or not that project was awarded tax credit, um, probably yet in May or maybe the first part of June. If that is awarded those tax credit um, uh, funds or tax credits, then that's another project that goes, um, that goes on the, the, the front burner for immediate action. Next slide, please. And, and you can just hit all those little animations. So, so then we're also looking at, at the whole financial picture of the of the housing authority. Um, and you can see you can see all of the all of the activities there. Next slide, please. That gaps. Um, then this area is really looking at the level of support services needed in. Um, and basically, all of the resident, most all of the residential units are um, are senior units, are senior developments, with the exception of one, which is a family development. Um, and those really need what we call like a lighter touch. So, how do we support residents that are living there um, and create a, a model that they really don't have in place now? And then the heavier touch case management is really looking at the suites, which is more permanent supportive housing. Um, model and and residents that are living in the suites need much more support in case management than they're getting now. So we need to look at how to uh, address that. Next slide, please. Um, and then and then kind of the those are the those are the things that are, are immediate action that we need to take care of in the next uh, few months. And then really look at um, the strategic planning forward expectations, looking at how do we uh, really address and repair the, um, you know, the, the image of the, the housing authority, but we need to take care of all of those other immediate actions first to stabilize the, um, the Lama Housing Authority. Next slide, please. And then continuing to look for the longer term about um, development opportunities, which I talked about initially. So about your utilization and expansion, how do we have the Lamont Housing Authority be a, a stronger partner in our inclusionary housing efforts as the money comes in from inclusionary housing? You know, how do we establish the Lamont Housing Authority as a viable development partner? Um, and then there are a couple of other uh, areas that we identified there that will need some redevelopment um, or and development in the um, in the not too distant future, but it's a little longer term down the road. Next slide, please. And then this is our warp speed time frame. So, so right now, uh, in the in the next couple of weeks, we'll be working on um, an operational agreement that uh, that really formalizes the role between the housing authority and um, and the city of, of Longmont. Uh, it'll probably be a two-part process I'm imagining. First will be a, a, like a memorandum of understanding um, and then that will identify a, you know, how we're going to work together. And in essence that the, the city, the, the goal would be that the city is going to have operational oversight, if you will, of the kind of the daily operations of the Lamont Housing Authority. The Housing Authority Board will still have its policymaking role and um, and our, our our attorneys and their attorneys are going to structure that so that they still remain separate organizations with um, separate 
liability, um, but that the that the city will have um, operational oversight of um, of the Lamont Housing Authority. So we're trying to figure out that, and then you can you can kind of see the um, within the the next six months to really have addressed some of the um, the how the to stabilize, to look at some of the, um, a new operational model, and then continue to do some of the other kinds of changes with some time for evaluation. And then after three years, and again, this time frame, I'm sure will change, but it's, it's the best time frame we come up with, with the information that we had, to really look at, you know, after uh, at least a three month, three year period, that, that we will have a better idea of what does that sustainable model for the Lamont Housing Authority look like? Is it, do we think that we'll be able to kind of return that back to being an independent housing authority or whether there will need to be a, a more um, permanent integration of the of that Lamont Housing Authority with the city of Longmont government or, or, or something else? So, you know, part of it, because it is a small housing authority, it's really hard for them to achieve the economies of scale um, to do what they need to do without significantly raising rents. And we really are not wanting to try to, to do that at this point in time. So we need to, we need to explore, we need to um, work with them to figure that out. Um, and we don't want to, when this happened, you know, two years ago, and we hired and they hired Jillian and it was really that there were so many things that had to be stabilized that she never could get her head above water if that makes sense and so this time and her recommendation is is that hey two years ago we probably should have taken this step then to get things stabilized before bringing in a new director to then position the agency for the future so that is my warp speed presentation. I think Susan, I think that's it. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. So you can turn it back to Brian and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Karen. Any questions for Karen? Clarifications? Council member Christensen, Jake, you're waving off. Go ahead, Polly. I just want to say, Karen, I am very, very thankful we're doing this. I've been advocating for us to do something about LHA for six years, and <laughs> uh, I think this is a very good move. Um, anyway, I, I, I really have been shocked <clears throat> at the what at Longmont Housing Authority. And, you know, and I think a lot of that is, well, so it's, it's a lot of different things. And so we, we just are, um, it, it's a big heavy lift, just FYI. So, so if you don't hear from Kathy and Karen for a while, you know what happened. Um, but it, it's going to take all of us really doing our best work together because we need the Lama Housing Authority. They provide um, housing for our most vulnerable and our lowest income residents. We need them to be successful and that's why we are all in. Thank you. Jake? Thank you, Karen, so much for the presentation. Uh, I was the one who asked for it, so I really appreciate um, I really appreciate that. It was a um, very thorough. I, I do have one quick question. Just You mentioned it actually, just about capacity and about, you know, staff's ability to take this on. You know, I I, I'm, I'm continually amazed by your ability personally to just take, keep taking stuff on and run with it in the, in the whole department. Do you, can you just talk briefly a little bit more just about kind of the plan for leadership over LHA and oversight? And are you going to be the point person for LHA for the next period of time? Or kind of what's the, what's roughly the, who, what's the leadership plan? Well, that, that's, uh, that's a great question for which I do not have an answer yet. Okay. Um, we are, we are working at that now. I would say that we've identified it, it is it is going to be a team. It's going to be a team approach okay, great. for a while. Um, obviously, there are going to, you know, we're going to have to have some identified point people. Um, but we are bringing in um, the best of 
the city staff that we have in the areas that we need, that we identified in terms of that discovery and opportunity. We'll probably bring in some consultation, some outside consultation uh, for certain aspects. And, uh, and it, it will be several city staff members along with Longmont Housing Authority staff members. Great. Um, Thank you, Karen, for that, and thanks for the work and for staff's work and taking that on. I'm with Councilmember Christensen completely. LHA has been in line for some reform for some time, so I'm glad to see the city taking it on. Thank you. Thank you. Caitlin? Uh, sorry, um, I actually have to run. I thank you so much, Karen, for the additional information. Um, really appreciate it and appreciate sure. all of the work that staff has put in for all of the presentations and keeping us up with this. Um, with all of the changes in the world right now. So um, Thanks, thank Caitlin. you all. Thanks for hanging in there. I do want to quickly invite Eric, if you would like to try to answer a few of the questions that were thrown out about Longmont Community Foundation, your program, go for it. <laughs> thank you all. Actually, I wanna commend you all on, uh, on the enormous responsibility you have to uh, make for uh, dealing with the uh, funding and the responsibility that you undertake with the with the public dollars so thank you very much for your service um, let's see I think I think everybody was fairly spot on with their with their information about the uh, Strongmont fund which Karen it's Strongmont fund or Kathy I think you said Strongmont fund it is indeed Strongmont yeah. fund uh, and that is for small businesses uh, 25 employees or fewer and it is um, uh, pending an assessment, really, all the businesses are encouraged to take an assessment before they actually can apply. Uh, we have received, when you look at the data, you look, you, uh, we're kind of hitting the groups we want to hit. So we're looking at minority businesses, veteran-owned businesses, women-owned businesses. So it's, it's really exciting to look at the data um, uh, that has come through initially in that. That application will be ready to go on the 18th. And the review committee will make those grants. Uh, the turnaround time is the 26th is what we're looking at, or May 26th to actually make those decisions. And we'll be, gosh, granting out those dollars shortly thereafter. Um, so we're looking at, uh, we, we are indeed raising money from public private dollars. And we're also using or being the housing or the hub for the, the other public dollars that are coming into that fund. Um, then finally, the neighbor to neighbor fund. That is, uh, we've actually had two rounds of funding. We've raised about a quarter of a million dollars and have granted out $185,000 in two rounds of funding. And the third round will probably be sometime, um, we actually had a board meeting this morning and we had talked about delaying the third round. Um, the sense is that uh, we reached a peak in donations to that and it's, it's fallen pretty precipitously. Um, so we are kind of in the uh, kind of the final stage, if you will, but we want to see how things are in the environment right now for nonprofits. I think everybody aptly mentioned the fact that, you know, all organizations are hurting and human services organizations that are even aren't really directly involved in COVID-19 relief are certainly hurting. Um, it's not unlike any other business. They are having to lay off people and reduce salaries and reduce staff. So it's not like your restaurants or anybody else in the community that's really suffering. So it will remain to be seen um, what happens to some of those organizations, but we expect that in the third round of funding, we're probably gonna be looking at maybe issues of childcare, um, mental health, um, and maybe broadening it to expand to other organizations that are actually seeking general help to kind of bridge those loss of fundraising dollars right now. Um, that's essentially what I'd say, but I, I think the one thing I really am, was really excited to hear is that you're all looking at simplicity in your application, which I encourage. I think that um, with shortened staffs and smaller staffs and overburdened staffs, I think it's really wise to, to go with a shorter and, and simpler application. So thank you. Sorry for going on too long. No, that, that, that's great, Eric. Thank you. Any questions for Eric while we do have him on the line? Okay, Eric, I just want to say that, uh, you know, I, I feel like the 
profile of Longmont Community Foundation has really increased during this time. And uh, I commend you on that, and particularly because I think that's a function of the fact that you really acted when it was needed. And uh, I, it's impressive. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we are about to be ready to adjourn. I just have one question. Is there any other business? Uh, Council Member Christensen has one piece of business. Well, this isn't, isn't really happy, but I just wanted you to know we got an update uh, for the last two weeks from um, Jim Golden, the Chief Financial Officer. First, we were on a $14 million shortfall. Now we're on an $18 million shortfall. But we don't know. It might not be that bad, but it's always better to be conservative when you're talking about you know, not to, to underestimate how much money you're going to have rather than overestimate. Yeah. So that's not so, so good. But, you know, the amount of money that this um, organization gets is a very small amount of our overall roughly $450 million budget. So, <clears throat> um, and, and it's very important that all of these organizations be funded because they're doing the work of the city. So anyway, Thank good you. night everyone, stay well. <laughs> Thank you. And I just have one other piece of business real quick and that is to congratulate Jake on his the, the receipt of his degree. I don't know how long it was in the oven, but it's, it's done. Congratulations. Which degree? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I took um, three years off from my undergrad at CU Denver to go do sports and travel the world and do stuff, and I'm finally finish it up, and then I start grad school in the summer. So I, I, uh, I'm finished up with a BA in history from the University of Colorado, Denver, and headed to go be a history teacher is the plan. So. Wow. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you all so much. Okay. Is there a uh, motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn. Well done, Karen. And a second, if there's no other business and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>